Hi, Kelly Gerard. Hi, Jalen Livingston. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Where are you in the world? I'm in um, I'm in uh, Manhattan on the Upper East Side. Oh, okay. In, in, um, in my little office. Uh, how about yourself? I'm in Harlem in my little house in my little apartment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're here to talk about the Fire This Time Festival 2022. Yeah, um, so yeah. super exciting, and uh, we actually are doing it. We beat COVID, or at least we beat it back enough to to do our to do our show. <laughs> yes, I mean, I feel like we are have been the embodiment of the show going on. I mean, just right. all the effort that was put into saying, like, nope, this is it's going to happen. We're going to make it happen, and. Uh, you know, that has so much to do, uh, you know, thank you for, um, it, it, was, it was like two years, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, you held on with us. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank of, you. Course, of course, of course. So we're here with PDF um, and we're going to be answering some questions uh, yeah. about this year's festival. Well, oh, I think we have to introduce ourselves first. Oh, yeah, we have to do that. Yeah, let's do it. So, hi, I'm Jalen Levingston. I am a freelance director here in the city and uh, I'm a proud community member of, of the Fire This Time Festival and am co directing this season with Tracy Conyer Lee, amazing playwright, artist, and director. And uh, yeah, I think that's good. I'll pass it to you. Awesome. Okay, I'm Kelly Gerard. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I uh, am the uh, founder and executive director of the Fire This Time Festival. Um, I have dark hair, uh, dark eyebrows. This is so odd, me describing myself. Um, I'm wearing a red dress and some red lipstick. So I'm doing the most with the red today. Uh, so yeah, that, that that's that. I'm wearing an orange sweater that is a turtleneck situation with like doves flying. Um, don't ask me why. I have a kind of like a curly fro moment going on and some uh, brown frames to match my brown skin. And I have a, a quite biblical beard going on right now. Yes, <laughs> Also, I love the doves because I'm just like, you know, see, that's just princes everywhere, right? I mean, we, yeah. we'll just never escape. And I yes. love that. <laughs> well, that's the exact reason I wore it. So you're welcome. Yeah. All right. Uh, tell us about the origins of the Fire This Time Festival. What lit the flame and how did you become involved? Oh, awesome question. One of my favorites. So, um, so 2008, um, I graduated uh, from my uh, MFA program in playwriting at Columbia. And um, while I was at Columbia, um, at, it seemed pretty clear to me that I was going to have to um, find a space where I could really stretch my voice. You know, as, as a playwright, I was really getting to know my voice as a, um, um, as a black writer, as a black woman. And, um, and, and, and wanted the ability to be able to continue to explore that in a way where um, there wasn't gonna already be a, a lot of restrictions placed on my voice in that um, exploration. Um, the other thing is too, is that at the time when I graduated from Columbia, um, I was hearing about all of these awesome playwrights, uh, Katori Hall and Marcus Gardley and Rada Blank and Pia Wilson, just all these people. And I was just like, where are they? Like, um, so um, the farthest time was really founded from a like a uh, an overlap of a lot of things. You know, one was wanting a space to really be able to explore my voice unrestricted. The other was to build community and to know other people's um, work, and um, that all culminated in uh, what was the first weekend of the Fire This Time Festival, which was up in the Red Room at the time of um, of uh, what was then also called Horse Trade at the time. It's now frigid and they no longer have the Red Room. Um, but um, myself and about six other playwrights, uh, myself, Katori Hall, um, Rada Blank, Pia Wilson, Derek Lee McFadder, um, uh, Deborah Seamway, and Germana Toussaint, um, we got together, we wrote 
10 minute plays. We put those plays up and the rest is history as they say. <laughs> wow. Um, and this is not like an offshoot question, but was the idea for it to be a, a festival that was annual like it has become or were you like- Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I, I, I'm be totally honest. It was purely selfish from my perspective. I was like, I had just come out of school. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to see my work up. I was craving community and, um, and never thought that it would become something that I'd be working on 13 years later. I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard. I mean, I think of myself at the time being 26 years old, it's so hard to have a vision that long, you know? Um, and it was, and I, but I think that there was so much momentum behind what we were doing and what we did and recognizing how special it was that um, we just kind of like organically kept moving with it, you know, um, to the point where we are now. And, um, you know, um, which kind of uh, uh, leads me to, you know, talking to you, Jalen, and about your um, experience with the festival, because you as a director is about like your third iteration uh, in terms of how you've um, been a part yeah. of the festival over the years. For sure. Yeah. Like, um, and, and you probably heard me tell the story before, but I graduated uh, from college in Los Angeles in 2015. And I moved to New York in 2016, in January of 2016. And uh, playwright and actor Larry Powell, um, I didn't know anyone. I, in New York. I like moved here with three suitcases, one equity check, and you know, a dream. And I didn't know anyone. And so Larry was like, when you move to New York, just go directly to the Fire This Time Festival. Like I moved here like on a Tuesday and the festival's open mic night was on like a Friday. It was the first thing I ever went to uh, when I moved to New York. And it was an open mic night and uh, Angelica Cherie was hosting with uh, X Mayo who are both doing unbelievable things uh, right now. And uh, I, you know, performed a piece and uh, I always tell people that like, Probably for a year and a half, almost all of my gigs, I could trace back to people I met at the Fire This Town Festival that night. Um, and that wasn't even like the big, you know, full community night. Like that was just like, you know, open mic night. And, and so much for me came out of that. And I eventually uh, became a line producer with the, the Fire This Time Festival. And then I also have had work read in the festival. Um, and, and now to be directing in the festival just like, feels very uh, full circle. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's, it's been incredible. I, I love to hear that story, Jalen, because I love that um, the, the space was always meant to also for us to not just explore our own voices, but like how um, exploring ourselves differently in a creative capacity. You know, I think when, when you go to an art school, you come out and it's like, okay, you went for playwriting. You have to be a playwright. That's the only right. thing you can do. You want to, you have to be a director, you have to be an actor. And like, the fact of the matter is, is that not only does the work benefit from us being able to see it from all different angles, um, but we are never really just one thing, you know, right. like, I mean, d d d directors um, are na naturally do dramaturging or, you know, likewise. And so like, I, I love hearing that story. And, um, you know, it's funny. So that our next question is how has the festival evolved over the years. And I think that th this is a re really beautiful segue into that question because, um, you know, what started out as, um, as a 10 minute play festival has really morphed into, um, there is the flagship 10 minute play festival, but then um, we also are supporting work in a variety of other ways. There's the, um, the, the new play lab uh, development, which I give huge props and credit to AJ Muhammad um, who is one of our um, producers, and Cynthia Robinson, who Cynthia herself also started with us as a playwright and also now has the opportunity to not just write, but to be able to produce and to help um, bring other writers um, uh, kind of develop their full length plays and really oversee that. Um, and um, and yeah, and you know, and we we've had the, the the programming that has grown out also, just in terms of the um, you know when we did have open mic night, and um, you know at one point we had like a you know um, one person show showcase, 
Um, you know, so so we've been able to kind of like really, really grow our program and think creatively about that. But I will say that the heart of who we are in terms of um, not straying from the mission that this is about the artist, it is about exploring their voice, giving them the space to explore their voices in the ways that they want to exploit, that has never changed. No matter what we, we do, every single time the opportunity presents itself, we always ask ourselves, is this continuing to enable this, this, this mission, just being able for, for people to be able to explore their voices. And as the, the festival has gotten more and more notoriety, nor, notoriety over the years, I think what's been awesome is to watch you all double down and continue to just like invest in writers that maybe people haven't heard of yet. Uh, like truly emerging voices who are, you know, looking uh, at the fire this time for that first opportunity, some of them to have their works read on stage. And I know like some organizations, you know, they get a little shine or they get a big award or whatever. And then it kind of becomes about like how to keep it shiny. And um, it, it's really great that like even this year, there are artists who the Fire This Time is the first platform, the first stage that any of their work is being read on. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad you bring that up because for, for me as the, um, I, like if there is a name that I recognize in the roster, like it's a, it, it, would, it would be, it's surprising to me, meaning that like, every year the the crop of names of playwrights we have are brand new to me and i love that i love that we are cons constantly surprised by, by by voices we're constantly surprised by and i think it just speaks to you know just how much um again how, how many people are out there how many people are, are writing and um and it's exciting you know mm -hmm. The festival has showcased an impressive roster of early career playwrights who went on to great acclaim. What are some of your favorite success stories? I will totally give that question to you. Uh, that's, see, that's a hard question to answer, y'all, because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I honestly, um, you're right, there are so many success stories, but I'm also very um, uh, specific in how I talk about success. So for some of our writers, I, I think that, you know, the biggest success stories to me are the ones where our artists are thriving and doing what they wanna do. And, you know, and that may look different for everybody. Um, you know, I, I, I know that the, um, probably the shinier answers would be like, you know, someone like Jordan Cooper, who goes from doing his 10 minute play to the public to now everything he's doing with BET. And, you know, obviously Katori Hall, you know, it's like uh, Katori, you know, the mountaintop went up about the year after, um, you know, Dominique, Rada. I mean, but there are so many playwrights who have just been able to finally um, get to a space where they're just a working writer. Right. Where they're where they're, you know, doing fulfilling work, um, you know, directing here, doing this there. Um, so so it's a, it's a hard question for me to answer, because so much of what I consider success for the fire this time is having a thriving community. And it's very it's all it's very difficult for me to pull out single people, because as a whole, I think that um, that uh, uh, th that that collective success and that community feeling and how we all show up to each other is the biggest success uh, story yeah. too. Yeah, when I think about, you know, when I alluded to earlier, the amount of work I got, you know, from people I met at the Fire This Time Festival, it's also like intimately wrapped up into like the amount of close relationships that I begin to develop that year as well. And like that feels like a certain kind of success um, as well. I think of uh, the writer uh, Nathan Youngerberg and how I met him that night at Open Mic Night. And now he is one of my long term collaborators. And we always are giving each other jobs and, uh, and, and thinking and developing and just checking in on each other. And, um, and that's a kind of success, I think, in and of itself as well, just like family, real family. Yes. Yes, that, I agree. I just talked to Nathan yesterday. <laughs> Love Nathan. 
What are the qualities you look for in a play or a playwright? It's an interesting question. I guess in general or just like in the the shows, in the in, in the festival. I know I can you know say that the festival has its own committee of of readers and its own process and every year you know uh things change in terms of like the exact kind of show that everyone's trying to make um yeah i don't know how would you answer that question yeah well so the interesting thing is is that the festival was founded entirely on this premise that um uh the, the we don't have a theme we don't have a, we don't have a a, 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 um, a theme or an aesthetic. Um, mm -hmm. The quality is blackness. I, I mean, if 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 you're a, a black playwright, black identifying in the black diaspora, you know, it's like um, submit your play. Um, the the reason why we decided to not have themes or restrictions or anything from day one was because so much of that has already. Um, uh, limited the black voice, um, you know, over generations, you know, uh, I think our, our specific, um, motto is, is that any play written by a black person is a black expression, even if it's about two white people in love. Um, so by allowing people to just submit what is authentically their story or authentically their experience without any restrictions or telling them, Hey, you know, you have to change this thing. That really, um, uh, I, I think, not only opened our eyes to the just the spectrum of the Black experience, which is constantly growing, um, but um, I think it's honestly what allows us to continue on because, you know, that it's a there's constantly stories being added, right? Like, I mean, we could go on indefinitely because the Black experience is indefinite, and not just the, the stories that you know, we still have yet to tell, you know, so, um, so there, so, so yes, we certainly do have a submission like process, you know, and, and we rely heavily on, on, on nominations from the community. Like we, every year we ask our, our playwrights, directors, everyone who's ever worked with us, who should we, you know, you know, send this out to. And then we go through, you know, somewhere between 70 and a hundred plays. And, um, and we really just, we read them blindly um, and, and, and we do that so that like, you know, because I think naturally, like if, uh, you know, if, if a friend of mine submitted and I saw their name, it's going to change the way that I'm, I'm reading that play because I really want to see them succeed. Um, so we read the plays blindly. Um, we have two mystery readers because, you know, I think it's very important for us to not get caught up in our own aesthetics or the things that we lean towards. And, um, and then we kind of narrow those down and then we sit down as a, um, as a team and, and, and we talk about the plays and that's really what goes into it. Um, but we don't, we, we don't have any necessarily um, guidelines other than uh, be black and be honest. <laughs> yes, love it. The 10 minute play is the backbone of the festival. What's exciting about this format? Jalen, what's it like directing these short pieces? Well, we're just about to start rehearsal soon. Um, but yeah, the 10 minute format is fun, isn't it? It's it's like this kind of, um, I don't know, it's like the fun size Reese's or the yeah. or, you know, <laughs> party pack, you know? Um, it, it is, uh, it creates like the, I, mean, I don't know, my experience of like even watching the 10 minute festival, it just like feels like a rocket, you know, mm -hmm. the start, you go and you're like, whoa, was that an hour or was that five minutes? You know, mm -hmm. it was just super intense, fun uh, night. And it's also really freaking hard for the playwrights, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the, the short form is a very, very difficult form to write. And so it's really clear when you are hearing someone's pen game be really strong within a 10 minute form yeah. uh, or a 10 minute play because it is so difficult um, to, to write a beginning, a middle, a middle and an end and make it feel as if, you know, it's just this story, there's no part two, this is the little, you know, appetizer that I have made for you today is, is very difficult. And so um, I think that like the directing of the plays have a surprising amount of uh, rigor to them, I think. 
Um, and that might be something people may not always expect when you think about like rigorous work, you think of like mm -hmm. long or sprawling or like very, very complicated stage wise, but it's actually really, really difficult to say we have to make an event happen in 10 minutes and then yeah. on to another event. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'll tell you what's like, what's personally exciting to me too. And, you know, just being from Louisiana and just loving a good buffet, like, you know, the, the, the 10 minute play festival is almost, is like being able to sample a little bit of right. everything because like, how can you choose? Like, I mean, how do you choose between the crab and the shrimp and the, you know, and all that, like, you know, you kind of, you get to have a little bit of everything. I know Andrew's going to, Andrew Black from TDF is going to appreciate that. Um, but, you know, also I think that what is, what's also very exciting about, you know, when, when I personally sit down to the, to the 10 minute play festival, what the director and the actors find in terms of continuity or streamline in those 10 minute plays that, you know, these are seven different playwrights who are writing from seven different spaces who didn't know each other, didn't know what the other person was writing. And when it comes together, it's a full, evening like that's like that is the really exciting thing for me i mean i remember like you know when there was just year over year there was just these a collective through line in the plays for people who like had no knowledge of what the other person was writing and and that's why i say it's also truly a reflection of um where we are year over year as black people reflecting our black experience you know because of what's happening outside is affecting us and we're all in conversation with each other to some to certain level um even if we're not actively talking to each other and so that's a really beautiful thing to me about this when it comes together totally totally um cool you have a long-standing relationship with bridget nyc's crane theater what do you like about the downtown theater scene and do you have any memorable stories about working at the venue i'm sure you could write a book yeah <laughs> yeah. Not being at the crate. Um, I mean, first, you know, big shout out to Era Ziv. Um, I call Era Ziv the, the patron saint of New York City theater because I just don't think that people realize the amount of work and incubation that Era Ziv supports that then goes out into the larger New York theater scene and Without indie theater, we just you wouldn't have a lot of the artists that you you have that eventually you know are at the public or wherever. They all started somewhere, and um, when I first went down to the Crane Theater, like in two thousand eight. Um, Era Ziv was one of the only people that was just like, "Oh, you want to do something here? Do it. I'll give you a theater." Like, how often does that happen? It's so necessary and it's so needed, and Eras constantly finds space for that um same thing happened to me truly I, mm -hmm. um if it wasn't for a res i used to have a arts campaign arts advocacy campaign called words on white and we did the first event of it at the crane theater and i thought it was going to be just a one night only thing it became like a two years project but i didn't know anyone then and i had no money and i had no anything and i had only experienced the fire this time festival once and i just called, you know, arrest I was like, can we do this weird idea I have here? And he was like, yeah, go do it. And you're yeah. right. It's so hard to find people to say yes that quickly to just your thing that you want to do for them to open up their space like that. Yeah. And it's and that's why I think that the indie theater scene is is super important. Um, there are no stakes, you know, you 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 do the work. Um, and, and it needs to be um, supported more, needs to be, be supported as the incubator that it is and how much work, uh, how much of New York City theater it's eventually um, so supporting in its development. And, um, you know, it's, it's so hard to pick a favorite memory from Frigid because there are so many amazing ones, but, you know, I will say that, you know, um, you know, now that we're, we're 13 years out and um, and it's okay because we're not going to get in trouble with the fire marshal. But, you know, the um, the Red Room uh, used to be my favorite space. It was just the most wonderful little black box space. And that's where the fire this time started. And uh, if anybody's familiar with the Red Room, you have to walk up three flights of stairs to get there. And, you know, so for about four days straight, 
we just had so many people walking up those three stairs, you know, um, at one point, you know, we, we had to put the gate up because we were over capacity. We had people in the aisles, in the seats, on the floor, even all the way back behind. <laughs> the we couldn't accommodate anybody else. And people, you know, opened the gates and came in anyway. And, you know, um, so we were definitely in danger of, uh, of, of something bad happening. Thank God it did not. But the point is, is that like, you know, there was a space that, because of who Erez is, created um, that type of environment right. where people were welcome and people came with their best selves. I mean, it's like how many, I mean, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm like, you know, it's like, unless it's like this show was really lit, I'm not walking up three flights of stairs. To, right. to go to the floor, you know, but it's like, but this was, this was such the energy of that, that I think is still at Frigid. Yeah, totally. Can you speak about the cultural moment we're in and why your festival is essential for this time? That's a big question. I mean, the first thing I literally thought of is like the cultural moment of like not even knowing if a show can go on, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, apart from anything that's going on like outside of our industry, like our industry is in a cultural moment where any show that goes up is a miracle. And I think for, the fire this time, particularly, obviously, you, Kelly, and, and Caesar, to be so committed to making sure that these playwrights have a chance to have this platform, despite everything that's going on. You know, we've had to postpone at least twice um, due to the pandemic and kind of restructure and reimagine. And um, that feels like probably the best gesture that these artists can have is just like, a place said yes to them, and then they just kept saying yes, even when <laughs> things seemed impossible, you know? And like, honestly, I, I think there was a part of me that thought, well, we probably won't really do it this year. You know, it's just gonna be too difficult or whatever. And and then to get the email that's like, no, we're, we're doing it, we're back on, we moved it to this date, and this is how we're gonna make it work, you know? There's just so many, I remember when the pandemic first hit and just like, so many shows that went down and just never got an opportunity to come back. Uh, actors got, you know, never had this opportunity to kind of fulfill, you know, this moment that they were in. And so I'm just like really happy in this cultural moment that like resiliency is still like this, this value um, that uh, is coming out of the festival. Totally. And, you know, just to, to piggyback on that, you know, I think that, um, uh, Black Americans have always had things to overcome. And I think, you know, the way we got through those things was um, by um, uplifting our stories, uplifting our voices. I think that the, you know, creative process has been so essential to our forward moving, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we just, you know, we, we, we came out of a pandemic that disproportionately affected us, that disproportionately affected our Black communities. And um, and while actively dealing with the, you know, uh, ongoing uh, pandemic of racism and, you know, and seeing what we saw, you know, um, happen to George Floyd. Um, and then now, you know, being, you know, what, a month out from a targeted massacre of our elder, uh, our black elderly um, community members. And so, you know, what's essential to me, to anybody who is trying to um, move forward and, and move forward into the future is, um, is for us to be able to see ourselves in that future. Mm -hmm. You know, when you write your own story, you know, when you write yourself, when you, you know, as James Baldwin says, you know, it's like, it is, um, the act of thinking of, of knowing that you're important and necessary and essential enough to record your voice and your experience, mm. you know, um, that, that it, it's, it's very essential. It's essential to us as individuals. Um, and, and it's essential to us as a community, you know, to see ourselves reflected on stage and to say, we're still here. You can't replace blackness. It's only ever grown and it's, we'll continue to do so. So, well, I mean, I feel like you know, a lot of, incubators shut down though during 
this time? And like, was that ever a conversation? And, and like, how come, how come we are able to keep going, you know? Um, because I don't want to discount the fact that there are like cousin organizations or theaters of ours that have like, you know, just decided this is, uh, I guess, it. This is our sign. So why was this not the sign for the Fire This Time Festival to, to stop? I mean, you've done the work and the legacy would have spoken for itself. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. That's such a good question, Jalen. It's such a good question. Um, and I'll, I'll say that because I think that for, for me, my, uh, my art has never necessarily been divorced from my activism. And, um, and, and as you said, and as we've talked about, like the fire this time has become so much more than a 10 minute, uh, play festival, um, you know, this is a space where we have come together to bury members of our community, you know, um, where, where we have pulled together to start GoFundMe's for people's family members who have passed away. You know, it has, it has become something so much more than the presentation of the work. And if anything, during the pandemic, we had to lean into that even more. We recognized that our community was hurting um, you know, and, you know, during the pandemic, we actually, we, we put together a digital stage where we had, you know, Reverend Melissa come and talk about, you know, the uh, importance of mental health care in the Black community and resource, how to access resources. Right. And um, uh, so, so we were, we, we, I think, uh, just organically kind of um, ha have, have become so much more and, and, and you know, and, you know, to your point, if not us, then who? You know, we 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 can still easily do it, and so um, so it's a so it's an easy thing for us to show up um, for for our community. But it's also, I think, very easy for us to to pivot. You know, um, it, it was very easy for us in the pandemic to say, "This is how we're going to show up for for people," because we don't we've never ever relied simply on you know this is a this is a play incubator. You know, um, we've also, you know, come together to, you know, as you know, I said, to, to produce memorials, to produce, um, right. you know, what ce celebrations, whatever it is, you know. So, I don't know. I really appreciated that question. You just really took me somewhere, Jalen. <laughs> yeah, no, it just, I was like, it just came up and I was like, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. So I want mm -hmm. to ask you. Yeah. yeah. You recently released an anthology of plays from the festival. It's so dope. Everyone get it. How did that come about and how did you choose the works? Um, so here I'm going to uplift Kim Weald, uh, one of my um, uh, uh, classmates from uh, Columbia, um, as well as just one of my favorite human beings and favorite directors in the world. I love Kim. And, um, you know, uh, Kim um, was working on a piece that she had just gotten published with Bloomsbury. And, you know, and Kim reached out to Bloomsbury and said, you must work with The Fire This Time. It is my wish that you publish their plays. <laughs> and, um, and that's really how it started. We, I think that we were, we had been thinking for a long time about how to start to publish the work um, and just could not get any kind of entry um, into that world until Kim came along and so, you know, and graciously made that happen. And um, so as I was talking to Dom, who is, um, you know, the editor um, of Bloomsbury, and we were just talking about how to put this first collection together. And I do say first because um, we will have more uh, because we have so many plays and I can only choose um, like 25. Um, I really thought about, you know, um, how uh, the, the past decade of the fire this time really did uh, speak to where Black America was, what we were experiencing, the conversations that we were having, and and what was coming up the most for us. You know, um, our 10-year um, anniversary was kind of bookended by the um, Obama presidency and the Trump presidency. So there's a lot of shit that went down between those 10 years that I think really gave me the opportunity to highlight aspects of the Black experience that were um, 
that we're just starting to talk about much more now. So I really um, curated the anthology um, into, um, in, in, into different sections about the, the Black experience, things that were specifically coming up a lot over the past 10 years, you know, um, policing and racial profiling, um, you know, gun violence, um, inequality in education, our healthcare system, gentrification, um, you know, um, but then also our forward looking, you know, um, uh, black love and black community and, you know, and uh, how we, you know, um, move forward. Um, so that's real. So that was really how this, this anthology came together. Um, love that. Oh, and you can find the book. Um, so you can find the book, um, 25 Plays from the Fire This Time Festival at every major bookseller. And I feel like to me, I felt like, oh my God, I finally made it when I saw our book on sale at Target. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, even Target? Wait, what the heck? But you can find the book um, everywhere, um, anywhere where they sell books. Um, and yes, you can get paperback or you can get um, a hard copy as well. That's funny. Right. Target, yes. Go to Target, get your Fire This Time book, get you a sundress, and get you, you know, some appliances. Um, exactly. <laughs> outside of the festival, what art excites you today? Are there any new voices whose work you are drawn to? Mm. I think everything excites me. I don't know. I, um, You know, I've been thinking a lot about... And I'm still like trying to find words to like articulate what I've been been thinking, but I've just been thinking a lot about like how there's an entire generation, particularly my generation, and maybe I'll just say like millenni millennials, whose uh, voices and aesthetics are not being um, represented on kind of the main stages, I guess, of um, our city and, you know, like the nation. Um, and I don't mean to say there aren't things being written about us um, that are out there in the world. But when I think about like, there's just like this really troubling aesthetic, I mean, this really troubling statistic that like in the past 22 years, there has only been three black directors to direct a musical on Broadway. And mm. only one of them has directed more than one and all of them were probably over 50 or 50 you know when they did so and so that haunts me and so i'm really like thinking about where my people are going to to receive narrative and so I'm actually really inspired right now by like concert tours and music festivals and like things going on in Vegas and like church services and Sunday service that Kanye West does. And like, and I'm interested in like, is it possible for like narrative to bubble up in those kinds of spaces? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, who knows, but um, I've been excited a lot about just like pop culture and music and fashion and art that is outside of Broadway um, that is making more space for uh, people of my generation to be actually producing new aesthetics. Yeah, I, I, you know, that actually, I think, uh, perfectly kind of um, segues into my answer, which is, you know, um, uh, since September, um, I've had the extreme honor and privilege of um, joining the Apollo as their director of new work. And just in terms of the work that I am encountering and ha and all the different levels, I mean, I feel like I'm like I'm 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 drinking from like a a, a fire hydrant. It's just <laughs> it's a it's an embarrassment of riches when it comes to all of the work that I'm coming into contact with. And to your point, Jalen, like um, you know, I'm working with um, Soul Science Lab right now, and they're you know building a project that lives in a VR and immersive world and like and incorporates um you know hip hop elements and incorporates narrative and you know and what um you know a director like Awoye Tempo is bringing to that you know and that is just exciting like it is exciting to me to be like oh my god we we're, we're going to go in this warehouse and and we're going to take a journey through the Harlem Renaissance through you know what Chin and Asante are building like it's that is phenomenal, you know? And then, you know, I get to work with artists like Kamasi Washington, who's, you know, um, jazz music is just 
to me, it's like, it feels like it's the first time I'm watching music that's like an accurate reflection of like my, um, my experience, you know, growing up in Louisiana, like, you know, graduate, graduating high school in the 2000s, I'm like, so you were de- experiencing everything from like, you know, I mean, like I was, you know, I was a Goo Goo Dolls fan and I was like, you know, a Jane's Addiction fan. And I'm like, you know, so it's like for me, like we're listening to rap and we're listening to country and we're listening to, to punk and we're listening to emo. And so when you experience someone like Kamasi Washington, who's just got influences from everywhere, I'm like, oh, my God, I feel so seen because, you know, you were always told, you know, oh, you're black. So you listen to this type of music, mm-hmm. you know, um, but mm-hmm. like it's just so so that's. Um, exciting. It's just exciting to see all of these elements come together. And then also just to be, you know, and to to working with people like Ta-Nehisi Coates and, you know, um, you know, Ted Bunch from A Call to Men and Salamisha Tillett, who are coming together and saying, how do we use our platform to create a new initiative that would help um, to to, to make people more aware of um, of um, uh, you know, um, sexual assault or make people more aware of um, what survivors experiences are like, I mean, it, it is uh, like when I say like, there's just a wealth of stuff that is influencing me right now. And what leads me to be like, oh, my God, like, you know, our future is so bright is because it's just a collision of the most brilliant work happening. It's 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 incredible. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on right now. And also to shout out another artist that I'm deeply inspired by right now, my good friend, uh, who's the president of the Broadway Advocacy Coalition, Britton Smith, has an amazing band called Britton and the Sting. Um, it is one of my favorite bands right now. And it's cool when your friends are are uh, people you are fans of. So that's also a- mm-hmm. Indeed. Last question. What do you hope this year's audiences will take away from the festival. The first thing that came to my mind is there ain't no stopping us. Mm, mm -hmm. No stopping us. You know, it's gonna happen and, you know, it's gonna be a beautiful, beautiful weekend of new work, of exciting talent, of I think things that Tracy and I are thinking about to, you know, make the evening special, I think are, are gonna be really exciting. Um, and I would say that I, I I am just like looking forward to the people who will come to the festival very similarly uh, to how I came to the festival, like looking for something to take away, right? Mm-hmm. Looking and not even in just the work, but in the people looking for a community. Like I hope uh, the energy of this year's festival is one of like super open arms and that uh, people can come and find their tribe uh, uh, with us this year. Yeah, I, you know, I'll say the same to all of that, Jalen, and just um, joy. Joy, and I think um, to be reaffirmed that, um, you know, everybody in that room, everybody in that experience, to just to, to, to just remind people that they're loved, they're valued, you know, um, you know, it's like, especially, you know, it's like we're constantly, you know, under attack and to just, you know, to just remember that you said it, Jalen, ain't no stopping us. We are not replaceable. Mm-hmm. We're not replaceable. So don't let that um, limit you in any way, you know, come be inspired by these stories to tell your own story or to make a way for somebody to tell their own story. All the things. Yeah. And you can get tickets for the Fire This Time Festival this year um, at tdf.org. So I uh, want to thank the organization for helping uh, us get the word out and giving us this opportunity to chat and catch up and to uh, really, uh, I don't know, just really reflect on the last um, couple of years, but also the entire history of the festival. And I'm mm-hmm. super charged and excited to go into rehearsals next week. Yeah. And can, can I also just shout out, I mean, you you shouted out um, uh, Tracy Lee, your co-director, and I just want to shout out our artistic director, uh, CJ Williams, um, our producer, Julian Hairston, AJ Muhammad, Danielle Covington. Um, you know, without uh, the fire this time, uh, team is just um, outstanding, outstanding. Um, we are a family 
and um, I am honored and privileged uh, to, 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 to hold the space um, with them. And um, so, yeah, so love to y'all. And um, yeah, awesome. come see the show. Can't wait to see you there. Yeah.